Good day, everyone. This is uh, Doug Robinson, Executive Director of NASIO. We are going to get the webinar started in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we have uh, several hundred people registered for the event today, as so we want to give everyone a chance to get on uh, the, uh, the webcast. Uh, just so that everyone knows, uh, everyone is muted, so please post your questions in the chat box in the questions panel on the right-hand side if you have any questions, and we will try to get to those at the end of the webcast today. Uh, I'm going to put, we're going to put a short poll up, one question poll on emerging technology. So while you're waiting, if you would go ahead and take a moment to answer that poll, and Al and I are both going to talk about on emerging technologies at the state and local level. So appreciate if you would uh, throw us that poll, and we will be back online with you in just a minute or two. Thank you. Good day, everyone, and I want to thank all our attendees for being on the webcast today. Again, this is Doug Robinson, Executive Director of NASIO, and I am joined today by Dr. Alan Shark, Executive Director of PTI, and we're going to do our annual tech forecast. That This, I think, will be the 11th straight year that we've done this in January to kind of give you a preview of what's going on in both the state and local technology, and this will be strongly supported by lots of empirical evidence and lots of survey data that we have. So. I appreciate uh, if you uh, pay attention to what we're going to kind of cover today so you can have questions at the end. Uh, we are running uh, video here as well. We are ensconced at our offices at the Hall of States, uh, right down from the Capitol, uh, and uh, we have video running as well. Uh, if the video begins to break up, we're going to disconnect that and just go ahead to the, to the PowerPoint slides. But anyway, I appreciate uh, your attendance today, and I'm sure we'll have several more people joining us as we begin. So let's start with uh, state government and the uh, State of the States 2020. I'll walk you through some of the uh, the trends and uh, perspectives on that. I guess the overall uh, general perspective, not surprisingly, cybersecurity at top of mind for our state CIOs and our state leaders. Uh, at the same time, they're looking at uh, a workforce crisis in that area, so we can certainly talk uh, more about that. Continued evolution of the CIO business models uh, from kind of the classic owner-operator position that states have seen themselves in the last four decades. And we're seeing much more managed services, outsourcing, and several states that are going to the MSI uh, model with multi-sourcing initiatives, and they have towers of technology providers uh, from the private sector. I've got some data on uh, state government and the digital government, uh, what's going on in that space. This is an area that Local governments have probably been lagging, uh, given the imperatives back almost 15 years ago uh, about digital government and electronic services to citizens. States uh, really haven't kept up with the consumer and the private sector side. So the consumers as citizens are, are, are certainly used to a much better experience than they're getting from many of our states. So we have states that have really stepped up uh, about user-centric design and focusing on really uh, the, the citizen at the center of their online experiences, so they're trying to improve the, the digital experience. Uh, we saw from our initial poll uh, of emerging technologies uh, of most impactful in the next three to five years, artificial intelligence led the way. It leads the way in the states with 53% of our polling, and we'll talk about the results of uh, our two studies around artificial intelligence of the, of the states. So we see that adoption uh, growing quite, quite rapidly within the states. Uh, again, as we've mentioned several years, the continued evolution of transition within the state CIO organization, uh, more consolidation, more optimization, uh, hybrid models, uh, and those unification initiatives continue. And we're seeing more and more states that are beginning to reduce the diversity and complexity of their environment and move to that. And then finally, uh, something that's uh, always interesting, at least, is the uh, CIO transitions and the new CIOs we have on board. Uh, 2019 was a high year for the state CIOs, 25 state CIO transitions uh, through the middle of December, the last one. And so we had a lot of turnover, uh, 22 new governors uh, based on the 2018 elections. So obviously those, that transition reflects the new governors coming in. All of our CIOs are appointed officials, uh, so they most often come and go with gubernatorial transitions. Rather, we had several others uh, that made the decision to move to the private sector or step down and so we had the significant changes. So what are we expecting in 2020? Well, I would tell you that uh, based on what we've seen already, we've got a new CIO in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, she started in mid-December, and we just had a new CIO start in Missouri uh, about a week ago. 
So we would expect, although there was only three gubernatorial elections uh, in 2019, uh, we would expect our normal churn, which is usually 10 to 11 CIOs during 2020. So we'll expect to see some of those, those changes as we as we move forward. So uh, always uh, one of the favorite topics is the state CIO top 10 priorities. We do this every year and we talk about these uh, these topics. Uh, since 2006, we've done a ballot for the state CIOs and we get them to respond uh, to a series of forced choice rankings and they are to pick uh, their top priorities for the upcoming year. So in this case, uh, 2020, uh, we had 49 state CIOs uh, submit their ballots this year. So great response rate. And again, not surprising, cybersecurity and risk management number one on the top 10 list for the seventh uh, consecutive year. It's been on the list since 2006, as you can see. I guess some of the other things I would highlight, uh, digital government moved up from number four uh, to number two. Uh, it's been steadily moving uh, up the list. Uh, consolidation, optimization remains on there, as does cloud services. Uh, more emphasis on customer relationship management. Uh, that joined the list and uh, remains on there. Legacy modernization. Uh, off, often on the list from time to time is cyclical. Last appeared in 2017. Sometimes that has to do with the budget years, even years uh, for the state CEOs when they think they might be able to get some funding for uh, covering their technology debt. Uh, again, other topics uh, hold steady on the list or maybe move one or two positions. And then finally, number 10, for the first time in the top 10, we have innovation and transformation through technology. And that, that topic supplanted uh, the identity and access management, which uh, dropped down to number 11. So again, no magic in those bottom six or seven, eight, nine, ten. Those are always clustered with a small number of votes in between. But the message to the to the marketplace and to leaders and to others is definitely cybersecurity and and risk management remains a solidly a number one choice for the for the state CIOs. So I'm going to kind of pull the thread a little bit on that. We're going to cover three or four of these topics very quickly with data from some of our reports to substantiate some of our positions around these topics. State governments at risk, I think all of you are not surprised to, to see this. Uh, state governments remain attractive targets, and in 2019, more attractive targets, particularly with uh, state and local governments and other public sector entities because of ransomware. Uh, that was the topic of the day in 2019. So more nation state threats, the organized crime uh, syndicates are using ransomware to monetize their criminal activity. It's just much more effective than what they've been doing in the past with stealing data. Uh, we remain concerned about critical infrastructure uh, impact from cyber disruption. Uh, that is a concern as we have a number of states that have uh, critical infrastructure protection programs and they are really working with their counterparts in the other agencies, emergency management, National Guard, Homeland Security Advisors to form a coalition and get, get more stakeholders together to understand that. As always, the human factor continues to be a predominant issue, particularly with employees and, and contractors. Uh, the RSA, National RSA Conference in the U.S. is coming up in February. I just got some of their preliminary material and a lot of it has to do with human factor. And how do you uh, educate, how do you train, how do you prevent uh, human frailty in, in terms of introducing uh, some of the problems that we've seen particularly from phishing and malware. And a, a topic that certainly we've been talking about but uh, has begun, gotten more prominence in the, next, in the last the 33 years is election security. State CIOs are not responsible or accountable uh, for directly for election security, but they are collaborating with their state elections uh, directors and their secretaries of state around that. Uh, again, elections are held at the local level. There's over 8,000 jurisdictions that are responsible for elections at the local level. Uh, we are more concerned about disinformation and misinformation campaigns and what states can do around that more than the actual hacking of the elections infrastructure. So if you look at some of the data, and I'm, I won't cover all of this, but some of the data from our 2019 state CIO survey with uh, Grant Thornton and CompTIA, you see year-over-year -year comparisons of some of our uh, maturity indicators. Uh, we asking these same questions uh, since 2011. And you can see increases, some variability. We had a number of new CIOs, so uh, they, they, these numbers can vary, can vary from year to year, but they're fairly consistent in terms of the growth of some of the key things, particularly around developing security awareness training uh, programs and adopting a cybersecurity a strategic plan. We obviously advocate for that, as well as a cyber disruption response plan. Uh, states are still behind in terms of documenting that with metrics, uh, and we see an uptick in the use of 
uh, analytical tools, particularly machine learning. We see the future of, of this area being really supported by AI technology, so just not enough uh, capabilities and eyeballs within the state government to keep track of all the logs. So uh, those uh, algorithms can identify some of the anomalies uh, that they're seeing in patterns and build those and be able to protect the, uh, protect the state. A tiny uptick uh, in obtaining cybersecurity insurance, so we still have half the states that, that do not have that. As you can see, the current status in terms of the role of the CIO, the CIOs uh, play a predominant role either through policy or statute uh, for leading uh, the policy setting in cyber and responsible for setting that overall direction in the, in the cybersecurity space. The topic that has been discussed for the last two or three years, and for the first time we, we basically brought a question to our CIOs about whole of state cybersecurity, because we've been seeing this in some of the more recent strategic cybersecurity plans, is the whole of state concept. You heard this phrase perhaps uh, in collaboration with other state agencies, with Homeland Security, Emergency Management, Law Enforcement, National Guard, as well as external uh, utility companies and private companies, uh, local governments. Uh, so we're seeing more and more states that are taking this whole of state approach. So expanding the universe beyond simply the executive branch and looking at whole of state. You can see from some of the numbers that about a quarter of our states are, are already there in terms of their plans. But again, uh, many are interested in progress or plan to do that over time. We have examples of a number of states that already have kind of whole of state plans in effect and have exercised those during uh, during events. So we see that as definitely a, a trend. If you look at the issues to watch in, in 2020, definitely uh, need this local governments have a, need need support from the states. Uh, the states in many cases are unclear about how to deliver that. Uh, there's a there's a, definitely a gap there. Uh, we have a few states, but again, this is a challenge for, for the states in terms of understanding uh, what local governments need, but also having the resources to deliver. Uh, so that is problematic with 30, 5,000 plus local governments, uh, states are going to be challenged to uh, to be able to support them and with uh, with detailed technical assistance. But some states are attempting to roll out programs. So we talked about election security. We talked a little bit about emerging technology. That's one where again the majority of the states do not have a risk roadmap for introducing emerging technology. They don't have a formal governance program that looks at the risks around emerging technologies that are introduced into the state government executive branch. Third-party contractors, as state CIO, as broker models expand, we have more outsourcing. State government and CIOs definitely need to be concerned about security risks and have a, certainly more than a simple <clears throat> non-closure agreement that, they, uh, that these contractors have to sign. An area where states clearly are, are behind is IT, IT supply chain risks. Without just banning certain products, uh, that is something the states are struggling with. Uh, and they're looking to get some assistance from the federal government. And finally, we see some growth in the public records laws and FOIA exemption for cyber. About 27 states now have adopted those in the last uh, in the last couple of years. So speaking of state and local collaboration, uh, we asked that question, what services do you provide to local governments? Uh, probably more correctly should be what services do you offer to local governments? Uh, and you can see, not surprisingly, cybersecurity, security infrastructure, uh, number one, network services had been the top selection for many, many years, as well as data center hosting and co-location. So we have a lot of examples of state CI organizations that are now assisting and providing data center hosting services for their local governments and other large jurisdictions as they are constrained by, you know, by capital and by capabilities and by their workforce. Uh, so perhaps the states can assist them. And so you see some of the, you know, at least the top six categories and all the other additional insights uh, that we receive from this question around what uh, what state and locals are doing in collaboration. One of the areas that uh, that we focused on, of course, is uh, the cybersecurity piece. And so, just in the last week, uh, in a collaboration with the National Government Association, we released a a paper, a white paper on Stronger Together. And this outlines not only examples of a uh, number of the states that are providing cybersecurity support, assistance, technical assistance, remediation. Uh, preventative measures to some of their local governments, we also put together uh, kind of the top three recommendations of what states could do. And then one of the areas is they just had not built relationships with the local governments. So they, they really need to work through the municipal associations and county associations, uh, be able to provide that. And again, within reason, we know we, there could be some unmanaged expectations of what the state CO organization can do. 
the you know making them making the local governments more aware by holding summits and educating them. Doing we have states that are doing webinars for local governments around cyber. And the other certainly is one which has been going on for years is uh, how to include local governments in service contracts and technology contracts in general, particularly focused on local governments and maybe managed cybersecurity services. So we do have some states that have made those solicitations. Uh, when, when the contract is signed, they've made those offerings available to local governments so that they can take advantage of the economies of scale that we're seeing at the, uh, at the state level. In terms of uh, number two, top priority of the CIOs was about advancing digital government. And again, uh, from the standpoint of questions around what concepts uh, would be most valuable, most pur purposeful in terms of the, uh, the development of a digital strategy, you can see, not surprisingly, uh, that it has a lot to do with taking that citizen-centric approach. And so that, it, it kind of manifests itself in a number of things that states are doing. And we can we can talk a little bit more about it in the next section, but uh, you know, they, the citizens want to have a streamlined and uh, personalized customer experience with state government. Very challenging to do when you're trying to cross all the uh, the silos within the state agencies. Uh, they certainly can do that if they look at doing some single door entry points for multiple agencies. And we have again a number of states. Uh, we've recognized a couple in the last year or two with our award programs where they are really building on that and going to a single door entry point with identity services and digital credentials. So issuing digital credentials that can be used across multiple state agencies. Uh, and I think that's important to do. Enhancing the agency website, uh, having common look and feel, common navigation, all these things take time, but we have a number of states that have really uh, moved in that direction. Uh, and we have, of course, you see virtual chat bots are not high, but we do have uh, more than a dozen states now that are using virtual chatbots on their websites, so they can deliver 24/7 responses, at least to common common questions. So let me take a couple of minutes and, and then wrap up, and we'll talk about the CIO business models. Uh, we talk about this uh, every year to look at the how the CIO organization is changing, how they're evolving, and certainly we've seen that over the past 10 years. We've been asking the same set of questions around uh, how CIOs. Uh, plan to deliver of paying IT services, and you can see a continuation of the growth and the outsourcing uh, as a service models. 92% uh, of our state CIO respondents indicated that they're going to expand that, and we see examples of that with cloud services and software as a service being expanded, expansion of IT shared services. Uh, not surprising, uh, state-owned data centers, uh, they have been uh, downsizing for a number of years. There are a few states that are planning to expand that, and part of that has to do with they're now serving customers in the higher education market and in local governments that are coming to the state CIO to use resources of their tier three high availability data center. So it makes sense for them to do that for public sector uh, agencies. Uh, one surprise out of this year's survey was the uh, expansion. 26% of the CIOs indicated they, ex plan, they plan to expand their state IT staff. Uh, we probably should have dig dug further into that to find out the rationale it could be cyber although they haven't been getting increasing amounts of funding for that, uh, but also it could perhaps be some dissatisfaction with current contract services or staff augmentation in the IT space, and they want to bring it back inside. Uh, but again, those that generally that number has been 10% or less for several years. So we know over the last five years, there's been pretty much a flat line uh, IT, uh, IT government uh, employee uh, has been flat line for the last several years. So again, a little bit of a blip here. But again, continued movement in that direction of states making conscious decisions about how they're going to be involved in CIOs and delivering that. So let me wrap up with some perspectives on emerging technology. Uh, the poll indicated uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, robotic process automation, et cetera, et cetera, was the highest on the list. And you see from our state CIOs, uh, remains high at 65% of them indicated it's the most impactful emerging technology they're going to see in the next three to five years. Uh, that has come up uh, in the last two years and supplanted IoT. So IoT was number one for several years, and it continues to, to go down. And the promise, I guess, of AI and, and the promise of delivering uh, digital government and also the promise of streamlining processes, uh, state CIOs see that. Many of them uh, are actually working with their, their business partners in the agencies. The agencies are bringing those opportunities, and the CIO uh, may not be directly involved in that deployment. So as you can see, uh, about a quarter of them have already completed some kind of robotic process. Some of these are back office functions in finance and in transportation. They're doing reconciliations. 
Uh, they're, they're running scripts to basically take mundane uh, and time-consuming st- uh, processes and automate them using scripts and bots. So a number of states that are, are doing that. Because of the response of this report in 2019, our, our state CIO data, uh, we worked with uh, IBM and the Center for Digital Government on a more expansive survey where we just looked at artificial intelligence, and you can see some of the data here. Uh, this response but for this survey was at 45 states, so again, a very remarkable set of numbers here, but we also surveyed agency leaders, agency IT directors, we surveyed chief technology officers, so 45 states, but many more responses than that. And again, we looked at where they were in terms of their life cycle, 31% said they're still in that, that proof of concept, uh, but again, 30, 13% using it, but perhaps not in a core line of business. They're, they're testing at uh, one state, widely used across the state. Again, uh, that's only Again, a small, a small sample of only one state doing it where it's widely used. We expect that to grow, and you can see where they anticipate using AI predominantly in the IT space and cybersecurity, given the response co- cohort, which are primarily technologists and technology leaders. Uh, that is not surprising. Uh, but we did uh, ask them uh, what were the challenges and what was needed to unlock the promise of AI. Again, uh, data quality, data organization, uh, that the, the states don't feel like they have their data organized. Uh, many of the states have, don't have a roadmap. Uh, they haven't assessed their data for its uh, likelihood of being successful in, in, a, uh, in an AI space. Again, as I mentioned previously, no framework uh, for risk. Uh, and uh, in the policy side, uh, again, look at the numbers here, 72% do not have a policy governing responsible enough of use, and that's critically important. Uh, that they have that in place. Um, so uh, we would expect to see some maturity and some growth in this area. Uh, again, challenged by existing legacy infrastructure and also uh, the existing, the cultural resistance of the existing workforce. Uh, they may be, uh, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt around AI. They believe that uh, they may be losing their jobs because of this. But in reality, uh, they need the sales expansion to be able to do this. Um, they can be, go into more value add positions and use these AI capabilities and machine learning to do to do other work. So again, uh, that was the, the work we did on AI. These, both of these reports, uh, the AI report, as well as the state CIO report, as well as our most latest report, the future state CIO, in partnership with Accenture, uh, looking at how the state CIO role will drive innovation with some really good examples. And so those are some of our latest reports released in the last couple of weeks. So I invite you to go to the NASIO website and they're all available in a digital format. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to kind of turn it over to Alan, and Alan's going to talk about the uh, the city and county technology trends with his data and survey data. So, yeah, we've been doing this probably for 10 years, and uh, it's really kind of fun. In fact, we've actually tried a mid-year event as well in the summer to kind of make it more conversational and kind of see where things are going. But I think for both of our organizations, this has become – the, uh, the highest attendance event when it comes to webinars uh, that we, we both do. So I'm going to share some of uh, our data, um, and we're kind of uh, excited for a number of reasons, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, hold on. I'm doing that. So um, in terms of studies, I will say that uh, this is our ninth year of actually uh, having formalized research. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Our intent is to provide a snapshot of the technology management issues in organizations and priorities as it relates to local governments, cities, and counties. Uh, We expanded our survey this year to include new topics and areas of interest. The survey took place between November and December of last year, so the information I'm about to share with you is brand new. Um, We had a cross-sampling of 102 city and county IT executives who participated, which is a very good cross-section across the country. So uh, with that, I want to come back to where we are now with this survey. Uh, You may have heard that uh, PTI is now part of CompTIA, and we have many advantages being part of that family, one of which was that uh, our survey this year uh, was in partnership with CompTIA's research group, and they have been phenomenal. Uh, in supporting us, so we're very grateful for uh, their help. When we look at priorities over the next 10 years, our list is a little different and similar in terms of at least how we portray it. When we look at the horizon, and of course this could change at any time, 
Cybersecurity data loss prevention has been the top of PTI's list for the last seven years, as well as NASIO's. Um, innovation continues to rise up the list, and that being the second major priority. So that's kind of new. Uh, modernizing outdated IT systems, uh, applications, 55%. I think this is somewhat cyclic, but I think there's a greater pressure uh, to be more responsive. The idea is, oh, our system is old, it's no longer adequate, people are expecting more at all levels, both internal in government and in terms of citizens. Um, the next one would be launching or updating digital services for citizens. This kind of came out of nowhere. We kind of experimented with 311 systems that are more prevalent at the local level. Um, I believe there's some 311 systems at the state level as well. And uh, But there seems to be a renewed interest and both in providing the service to citizens, but also capturing the data. When these first systems were first rolled out, we weren't collecting data. It was more of a convenience to citizens and a way to uh, take various complaints or comments and direct them to the appropriate people. And we had all this potential data that was just being wasted. It wasn't captured and used. Now it is. Uh, so this becomes a very important tool to understand where the problem areas might be and where to best deploy the necessary resources. Next on our list was interoperability and integration of uh, desperate systems, followed by data silos, more real-time and actionable data. So this idea of data as a tool, as a resource, as an asset, continues to grow up the list. Then we have migrating systems and applications to the cloud. I personally think that the idea of cloud is, is a term that's been so overused. It's really about managed services. Um, we no longer have to have all this hardware equipment uh, in our own premises. And I would say, and I've said this before, my sense is that about 20%, if not more, of local governments probably should not be maintaining their own infrastructure when it comes to technology. It is becoming so complex and so hard to maintain and so hard to protect that, to me, managed services make so much more sense in terms of turning to a hopefully reliable provider, uh, who can have up-to-date information, and the latest batches, the latest equipment, and they can afford to do that because they can amortize this among many accounts. So this puts tremendous pressure on local government. And then finally, the last of our list was streamlining IT procurement uh, processes. This is a number one complaint that we hear over and over again, how long it takes uh, to get something uh, purchased. When we look at budget expectations, 72% um, of city, county CIOs expect their IT budgets to increase in the next uh, fiscal year. So in a sense, that's good news for the vendor community uh, that I would say that our people have been very successful and persuasive. I think elected leaders also recognize that they're going to have to invest more in IT uh, than ever before. The uh, city, county CIO is mostly satisfied with the ROI of IT. And this was an interesting question where we wanted to get a sense of you know, the top reasons for dissatisfaction with uh, return on investment of IT investments. From their point of view, 58% were mostly satisfied, 7% um, were mostly dissatisfied, and about 35% about in the middle. What they were concerned about is ongoing maintenance costs, support fees, and upgrades. They were concerned about staff time requirements to operate and maintain, usually not accounting for real-time cost. Uh, the complexity, poor user experience, which always comes back to haunt, uh, haunt somebody. Upfront costs too expensive for the return. Um, and features, capabilities don't meet needs. So one could argue, well, how did they engage with these systems to have these kind of comments? Hopefully, we'll learn more when we do some more um, studies that kind of compare things from year to year and get a better sense or interviews and dig a little bit deeper into these issues. When it comes to cybersecurity, which has been number one on our list for almost a decade, um, when we look at the priorities, the first one is training for general staff, for example, security awareness. Uh, I'm surprised how many local governments uh, still don't have ongoing programs. Everyone, I would say 70 some odd percent do have programs, but many of them are like once a year as opposed to continuous. I think. Uh, Doug and I both are advocates for continuous kind of programs to keep people alert at all times about the latest challenges so that this is something uh, that is not easily forgotten. The, uh, the next one would be modernizing defense and cloud security, followed by establishing a security mindset of all facets of government, 
then updating policies to reflect new threats and ransomware. And that's become, you know, 2019 was clearly the year of ransomware. And we're hoping that 2020, 2020 uh, is, is, is at least not worse and uh, hopefully better. Many of these attacks could have been prevented uh, with better perimeter, better training, better awareness. Uh, the idea of training staff in terms of technical training, I'm still amazed how many uh, folks out there at all levels of technology do not have certifications or certificates or, uh, or have they kept up with them in some cases. And this is a great way to keep up on things, um, and there are so many programs out there that one could take advantage of. Uh, the next would be developing and testing incident response plans. There's still quite a few local governments that don't have it, and we, we know that because we get questions. What does it look like? Who should be included? Um, we're going to be actually providing a new service where we can do tabletop for elected leaders so that they can feel an ongoing simulation as if they come to work and find that their entire city or county uh, has been um, uh, under attack or ransom ransomware. And we go through it in the EOC, what happens, who speaks, who doesn't, what do they need to know? Uh, we have to uh, look at adopting cybersecurity framework, whether it be NIST or some other models and other frameworks. We uh, are looking at deploying proactive measures and penetration testing to be more proactive as opposed to reactive. And then developing next-gen security, IA-enabled analytics. I mean, AI, artificial intelligence, is still in its infancy. Today, it does two things really well. In fact, I define AI today in practice as augmented um, intelligence as, as, well, actually augmented decision-making is probably more accurate. It helps us make decisions based on data. And of course, um, the data should be really uh, kind of clean or, or else we'll be making horrible decisions. So that's a, a concern that we have. But the other part is pattern identification. And when it comes to security, we be able to look at anomalies. This is a, sh a shift from five years ago when we had people at local government and probably state government as well looking at logs manually looking at logs to look for where the anomalies might be and decide where one might take action. So augmented decision-making has really become important growth. AI, I believe, will, will continue to grow uh, in so many ways, and it becomes a very exciting technology to watch. The um, wish list for training at CIO's agency department level, number one, more training on emerging technologies. That was interesting. The second was more training on core areas regarding infrastructure, systems, and data. The third was more cross-training to better understand government operations. The fourth is more training on project management, agile design, user-centered design. The next was more leadership training for managers and more soft skill training. I am bothered, and I know many other people are by the word soft skill because it sounds like maybe this is something weak as opposed to hard skills, but soft skills is about emotional intelligence. It's about leadership. It's about decision-making. And uh, many schools don't teach this in their technology programs. So this is a, a, a really important thing to keep in mind. And then more, so, uh, more simulations, real-world training scenarios, so that they're really getting a feel for uh, what's out there and what they can really expect. Emerging technologies has really moved up the list. Everyone's excited about some of the new uh, opportunities that are out there. And uh, these are technologies in some phase of adoption and or on the radar of city and county CIOs. For example, drones, unmanned aerial vehicles, 5G, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, automating technologies, autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, augmented or virtual reality, now referred to as mixed reality, and blockchain distributed ledger technology and robotics. On blockchain, many people may be surprised that it's actually being deployed in local government today. Cook County was one of the first uh, counties uh, in the nation, probably was the first county in the nation, that uh, incorporated uh, the whole uh, idea of blockchain in terms of its deeds and records office. So there's a lot of good stuff happening here. When it comes to potential opportunities for further collaboration between city, county CIOs and state CIOs, clearly more work needs to be done. Um, when we asked this question, the research shows that 49%, just about half, said this relationship is non-existent. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just non-existent. 19% said okay. Uh, good but limited, 29%. And uh, a smaller number said excellent. The areas very well dovetails with what SEO found. Cybersecurity assistance 
is really important. And we've seen some states really step out. There's some wonderful stories of what occurred in Texas, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And I know there are about four other states as well where they really stepped up. And what impresses me the most is they didn't have to do it. It was not in their mandate. It wasn't in a job description. Quote, unquote, it was the right thing to do. So uh, that excites me to see that kind of dedication. We are not in competition. We are looking uh, to cooperate wherever we can. We just have to find ourselves with each other. Uh, and it is a two-way street. 58% uh, procurement, and this is something that Doug mentioned earlier, the idea of contracting that can include local governments. Um, the next would be shared services, managed services, something very similar. Uh, looking for collaboration opportunities that may be unique to a particular state. And then smart city innovation, emerging technology, kind of exploring and sharing uh, with what's going on. And then, of course, cloud and data centers. In addition to the topics just presented, the survey also explored IT procurement, digital service delivery, staffing, budgeting, smart cities and counties, cloud strategies, and managed services. Um, and in the following weeks, we will be providing more information on these very topics. We also, you know, have dealt uh, with smart cities and the county ecosystem, and we're looking and taking a deeper dive into the usage and security needs and issues and how to develop or promote the need with elected leaders. We need to include them more than we have in the past and build a solid foundation for these systems. Right now, many local governments are experiencing that individual departments are doing their own thing versus a city countywide approach or strategy. This raises a bigger question, the idea of shadow IT. And many of our people are frustrated by the fact that while they're the, the, uh, the guardians of the network and uh, making sure that the technologies that they uh, use uh, are safe, uh, there are many people that have found some very clever ways through apps and other means to circumvent that. So this is kind of a trend that we would like to know more about. We also are looking at how do IT executives manage IoT uh, we're looking at AI, where it's headed, and can local governments develop a roadmap to implement it within the organization as a service delivery option? And then managing IT compliance, policy, and privacy. And this should be considered a priority, and not an afterthought uh, for IT executives. Uh, I mentioned uh, blockchain earlier. Whoop, excuse me. The uh, blockchain is being used, uh, especially for database management and records. We're looking at the maturity model of IT. Not every IT department is the same, so therefore, how can local governments depend and benchmark each other? This is something that we hear. Everyone's looking for a model. Can I benchmark against this or that? And it becomes so complicated. We'd love to be able to provide that. Um, we've worked with a number of partners that have tried it, um, but because of the complexity of the different budgets, different political environments, whether it's ones that's rural or not, and budget, and even staff and um, equipment maturity, it's almost impossible. But we are looking at regional approaches to IT operations and services. I look at my friends in the small governments in Massachusetts and New Jersey. These are communities that have such small jurisdictions, and these folks are struggling. The CIO might be a one-person show. It could even be an assistant manager, assistant county manager that wears seven hats, CIO being one of them. So, you know, I think the future will um, provide new opportunities for people to share uh, infrastructure in this area. The, I will move on to, well, the IT talent, something that comes back. We're finding that more and more localities are finding it more difficult to attract and retain IT talent. Uh, part of it is just the working conditions. It's not easy to work in government today in a, a, a current political environment. Uh, people make more on the in the private sector and as the private sector seems to do quite well, uh, it's really hard and it, it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on local governments to find innovative ways to keep good people, let alone the fact we have a number of people that are retiring. Folks are crying for more collaboration tools and, be, and are most interested in looking at managed services as a way to help them deal with this um, issue of attracting and retaining IT talent. And then the idea of soft skills. What should they be looking for, and how do they get better trained to identify these, these skill sets that are so important? Every year I do an in and out, which is kind of something that I do and I've been doing for the last nine years, where I look at some of the trends. And when I look at where we are today, the only thing that I would add to this is changing votes 
uh, that would be technology, uh, change votes is out and in is changing minds through technology. This is an election year, and while many of our CIOs are not directly involved with elections, we all are affected one way or the other. And I think the most scary and frustrating thing to many of us is the uh, idea that our very technology, our information systems can be turned against us and cause uh, people to fight amongst each other uh, and having the challenge to figure out is that deep fake, is that real, uh, and where is all this coming from? So there's a lot of interesting stuff that we have to navigate uh, as we move ahead. But clearly innovation has kind of moved to change management because that's an important element. Virtual augmented reality is kind of mixed, merged into mixed reality. Instead of hiring IT staff, we're really talking about managing IT staff, which might be outsourced in many ways. So that's my quick journey in terms of our research. Uh, for those who are interested, um, you are welcome to come to our website, pti.org, and get our Technology Matters, which comes out every Wednesday, uh, 50 times a year. And we have supplemental uh, alerts going out in Tech Moment. So there's a lot going on between SEO and PTI. And now we have cleverly allowed enough time yeah. for some Q&A. Yeah, let's uh, look and see if we've got questions in the chat box here. All right, we have a question here about uh, AI. What is RPA and RPA chatbot adoption? Now, robotic process automation uh, are essentially scripts. They're automated scripts, uh, and they uh, are developed, and usually it's a kind of a line of business script, and we see this. So that's probably the low end of the augmented intelligence uh, capabilities, but it's one where a lot of states are starting and there are firms that work with them to uh, take their business processing and turn that into an automated script that they can run. And they can run those bots again to do kind of mundane tasks. We've seen that in the financial side. We've seen it in the transportation side. Uh, we have a good example with Ohio with a, a project that they had about how to basically they had log jam in, in some of their applications uh, for some health benefits for infants and so they uh, started a, a bot called BabyBot and that BabyBot was able to go through those applications rather than putting again eyeballs on it by state employees and we go through that applications and screen them using the business rules uh, and, and really was able to break that log jam of the backlog that they had on, on all of that so thoughts from the, from the local government sector yeah I think we're seeing this manifest itself in chatbots as well mm -hmm. uh, they're up they're supplementing 311 systems and they're doing a lot of call pre-screening. So this is this repetitious stuff in terms of base, capturing basic information and being able to determine in a polite manner, is this something that can be handled automatically and to know exactly when to hand it off to somebody with more experience, well, with experience and who might be able to solve it. But the ratio of things being solved by these bots is becoming higher and higher because what's different is these systems are learning. And so it's not a static system. The more they answer questions, the user database increases, their experience increases, and therefore the response becomes richer. And on the, on the side, uh, uh, I guess a related area is the use of digital assistants like Alexa. So we have a number of states now uh, that actually have supported their web presence with digital assistants like Alexa, again, a low form of kind of augmented intelligence. Uh, states like Utah and Mississippi, Mississippi has branded theirs Missy. I think right now I know Georgia has some. There's about 10 states that have rolled out Alexa skills, uh, and that portfolio is growing. And, and Utah, uh, one of their first ones was uh, testing, basically in the, uh, testing for uh, the driver's license. It was, a, it was a study aid, and so if you had a teenager studying for the Utah driver's license, they could actually ask Alexa to help them. Alexa was, again, accessing information on the state's web presence and simply uh, responding verbally and again you think about assistive technology and you think about the elderly we have another states New York being one they're looking at these technologies or deploying pilots where again they folks that are need to have visual uh, impairments they can use these uh, virtual assistants and digital assistants to actually interact with state government programs so I think we're going to see these expand because they're kind of at the low end of the capabilities but also more in line with what the states need to do initially to get kind of their toe in the water on the AI front. So, looks like we had a question here in the past. NASA has highlighted the need for regulatory harmonization, uh, including overlap 
uh, was this examined in, uh, in either salary and is still a concern? Uh, it wasn't examined in our survey, but uh, coincidentally this morning, we released our 2020 advocacy priorities and the harmonization and normalization of the audit process uh, was our top ask. And so again, that just released this morning on the NASIO website. We have four advocacy priorities for 2020 and uh, that's at the top of the list along with uh, dedicated cyber funding for state and local governments. Uh, really promoting and uh, broadened use of the .gov domain. Uh, we have a you know, big gap there in terms of local government adoption of .gov. And then you know, regulatory, uh, I guess, not uh, overburdening uh, state and local governments with uh, regulations around emerging technology before uh, they have a chance to even be examined. But the harmonization is, remains a major issue. Uh, we are waiting on the GAO report. Uh, they've been working on this report about a year. Um, and we expect to have findings out in the next couple of months, uh, which supports uh, our assertion that uh, states are overburdened with duplicative and, and kind of overlapping cyber regulations, and they could be streamlined and could be harmonized to benefit the, benefit the state. Uh, good question for Alan here. Any recommendations on how to compete with private industry for IT employees? Uh, well, as a, as a former CIO uh, said at one of our events many years ago, uh, when he was asked about how to hire IT talent in the state, he said, you hide in the bushes and make a noise like a benefit. Well, that doesn't work any longer, as we know. Uh, the benefit packages are not as uh, as ideal as they once were. And uh, you, know, you look at the, any of the surveys from the state government perspective, uh, folks do not believe, candidates do not believe that state government is an attractive place to work, like 75% of those folks. So states have to do a lot. Uh, including uh, build connections and build networks and you know they can't just do what many states do today which is uh, post and pray you cannot post the, the, the job openings and hope you have to cultivate relationships one of the things that we have recommended and we see many more states doing this is to modernize uh, their job classification their titles they're, they're antiquated uh, they need to modernize those into broadband those California and the Yeoman effort in 2019 did that. They they collapsed hundreds of IT jobs into broadbands and and modernized the titles. So I think local governments have uh, have a, a real problem uh, with that as well. Yeah, it's a great question and, a, and an enormous dilemma. One has to be really um, clever, as, as Doug surmises. I, I know our friends in Casper, Wyoming, um, have a different kind of problem. Once they get somebody, they're never going to leave because they're buying into the lifestyle. But many of us don't have that to offer. Um, and the idea of public service is not what it used to be. So one has to be very inventive. I have been very frustrated when I asked the question, how many uh, local jurisdictions are allowed to change titles as opposed to classifications? Uh, Doug referred to classifications. That's different. Sometimes civil service, that's a tougher thing to do. You might be, you know, a, a level six, a level nine and whatnot. And my thinking is don't mess with that. If, you, if, you, if that's the problem, but allow people to have a title that lets people know what they do, whether you're a network engineer, senior network engineer, something that really gives a sense of what they do. That goes a long way uh, when you can't give the money that the private sector can offer. And yet there are many local governments know we have to treat everybody the same. The second would be to kind of pull out and give special pay uh, just when they're doing the federal government, people don't realize that OPM has kind of opened things up where they recognize that technology talent um, is something to be prized and it's a rarity to get good talent and you can find ways to uh, pay somebody more. The local government, I would say state government, needs to have that flexibility uh, to bring in that top talent. And finally, one can be creative in working with community colleges and maybe even with the private sector by having kind of internships or mentorships where people come in, uh, get the experience with the idea that they'll probably leave, but that's better than having nobody and then having somebody that they're associated with that has some accountability. So we acknowledge the problem. There are no easy answers. One has to really be creative and look at the partners. Maybe you look at the school system. Maybe you look at the election commission. You look at all the talent that maybe exists in a given area, and maybe you can pull together and be able to create more of a regional approach to that office of CIO with its branches. So when I look at the infrastructure in any given community, um, to me, shared services is more than just consolidating the administrative function. To me, shared services could also be how do we harmonize all these different components in a given locality 
uh, and I find that very often the CIOs never meet their counterparts in K through 12 or higher education or even within the private sector. It starts with that kind of dialogue, and uh, my sense is uh, answers will come. Yeah, as a as a follow up to uh, to, to that question, which is uh, kind of uh, always hanging over the state and local governments' head around they, the co compensation adjustments are not going to be large enough to accommodate that, but there's things that states can do. So our presidential initiative, President Boyette for North Carolina, is our current president, and his presidential initiative for 2020 is looking at next generation state IT workforce. So we're going to be embarking on a study. Uh, in 2020, probably a national survey with our CIOs to try to uncover uh, some of the innovative things they're doing, but also to address one of the real vexing problems of CIO organizations uh, change and morph uh, into more of this kind of broker role. It takes different skill sets, and we see from our own survey data that that's, a, that's an area where uh, they see a, a tremendous gap in terms of relationship management, contract management, uh, contract oversight. Uh, this they don't have the requisite skills within their organizations, and so we see that as an area that could could really grow. But we've got to forecast what's going on in the in, you know the next ten years in the, in states. One final thought on the uh, issue of uh, manpower or person power is there's an assumption that the private sector holds all the cards. Uh, now wearing my partial CompTIA hat, uh, one of the things that we're realizing, and one of the number one priorities for CompTIA is this whole thing of workforce development. We're finding that there is a shortage all around in the private sector as well. So the idea that we have all this talent moving over to the private sector, it's a much larger problem. And it's also a gender problem. We have a, a huge gap when it comes to women and minorities coming into technology. And uh, I'm happy to be part of an effort at CompTIA that's looking at that and actually developing programs to help bring them in. Particularly in the case of cybersecurity where it's less than 12% of the professionals in the information security field are women, so that's something we've got to address. Uh, let's look at uh, our state seeing IT bottlenecks in any certain areas when dealing with federal agencies. Uh, certainly, uh, yeah, the phone call coming through the person we assume that for the uh, census for online voting. Yeah, I, I think that uh, there's a credibility gap, uh, certainly in terms of what's going on at the federal space. Uh, but also uh, some of the relief that states have wanted and other these areas have been really slow to, to come together. Uh, and we've seen that now. We've now been talking about some relief on these uh, harmonization of cyber regs for three plus years, and we don't expect much resolution in the next couple of years, even with the GAO findings. So uh, that is problematic, the slow pace of that, uh, and it does impact. Uh, state governments. Uh, there are some uh, agencies, in particular programmatic funding, that have provided some relief and allow states more flexibility, but most are continue to be relatively constrained. And if you look at the legacy environment within the states, most of those large legacy environments are all federal programs, supporting federal programs for entitlement uh, and for workforce. And so we know that, particularly in the workforce area and unemployment insurance area, uh, that there's a, a lot of integration that needs to take place, and it's, it's been a real challenge uh, for that group. Uh, we have something, Alan Air, do cities and counties have the same budget challenges that states have for cybersecurity? And Alan's answer, that's going to be what budget? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it, it is a, a real problem, and um, no surprise there. How does that compare to states? I, I can't answer that because it's different scale. Yeah. Um, and it's also dependent upon the age of equipment and the uh, competency of those in charge. But we've certainly seen some, some really sad situations happening in the city of Atlanta, uh, in Baltimore, and other places. Some things perhaps could have been prevented if they had uh, more qualified individuals and possibly even better infrastructure. So we pay a price one way or the other. And I have to say, I don't want to open up this can of worms of cyber insurance. That's a whole separate area that uh, has some negativity associated with it. Uh, but I think cyber insurance uh, is not going to be the crutch that some people thought it might be. In fact, it could make certain local governments more of a target since insurance companies seem very willing uh, to pay out. So we've got to do more on the front end to, to prevent that. We need more budget support. I think the, the days when we used to be able to sell technology that will help save money, I think those days are gone. I don't think technology necessarily, it might be more efficient, it might save in productivity, um, but I, I don't think it's necessarily going to, it's protecting what we must. Uh, it's protecting where we have a legal uh, responsibility and, uh, and public trust 
is everything. So there's a lot riding on our ability to uh, get the funds necessary to protect the enterprise. Yeah, we have data. We will be doing our 2020 uh, National Cybersecurity Survey uh, coming up here. We'll be launching that in a few months for release in the fall. Uh, we're going to obviously focus in on that spend and that budget question. Uh, we've heard from anecdotally from some state CIOs and CISOs that they have received uh, budget increases. Uh, we're still you know, advocating for that. We're still banging the drum about that. But uh, you know, clearly anything that can happen at the federal level with uh, state and local a cyber resiliency bill around dedicated funding, but I suspect it will still remain around the two to three percent of their total IT budget, which is minuscule when you look at the again the threats and the continuity of government discussions we had. Uh, this is an area that's got to have to improve, uh, but it, it takes a long time to get that message through that uh, cyber is a business risk to the states, uh, and so we're competing uh, with a lot of other uh, areas for uh, for dollars. So we'll just have to see how that moves forward. We'll be collecting that data. Uh, and I guess this is, I think, our finally, probably our final question here for just a minute. What are the areas of focus for election security, voter registration, voting results portal? Uh, well, let me speak. This, uh, this is obviously execution. It's a responsibility of the state, but it's delivered at the local level. Uh, CIOs and NACIO, we do not have any formal positions uh, of areas focused around election security because it is not within our wheelhouse. State CIOs don't have uh, direct accountability or responsibility uh, for election security. But they are collaborating with their state election officials and their, certainly their secretaries of state around this topic. Uh, many state CIOs are responsible for hosting the voter registration database. So again, they're securing that environment, securing the networks. Uh, from a NACIO perspective, and it's one of the uh, one of the drivers behind our advocacy around .gov is uh, right now we are more concerned about disinformation and misinformation campaigns that are occurring that are, again are spoofing uh, local election board websites and other state activities, uh, sending misinformation about voting, voting precincts, everything else, voting times. Uh, that has been a more a, a problematic area over the last, uh, since 2016, particularly with the Russian and other nation state influence in this. Between social media, between spoofing websites, uh, this has become a huge problem. We expect that to be a very uh, significant problem in 2020. So again, part of the fact is can we get local governments on .gov to at least give them a special place uh, where we know and confident that it's a government entity and it's not uh, some spoofed website. So Alan, I don't any of you all have any uh, positions on on the, sec on the security of elections at the again local levels where it, where it gets delivered. Yeah, no, it's it's a local issue, um, but the election boards are really their own entities. Mm -hmm. I think more of them are reaching out to local governments. Um, this comes back to these silos that I mentioned at the local level, where we have all these different kinds of areas of expertise. They're not talking to each other, but I think scarcity makes best friends. And my hope is that more people will reach out and look upon where the strengths might be in a given community and work with each other. We are seeing that with local government and some of the election boards. They are really worried, uh, and they are reaching out, and they're looking for some help. Uh, and I think that a number of uh, our members probably are in a position to do so. Well, I want to uh, thank all our attendees today. We have exhausted our time. We had great, great uh, questions come in. Uh, we'll certainly take a look at those and follow up. Uh, we will be uh, looking at planning a mid-year. Perhaps uh, Alan and I will get together for a Q&A session in July, as we did in 2019, where uh, we will simply take these take these questions about where we are kind of in midterm. But again, uh, our thanks from, from Alan and I, from NASIO and PTI, for the hundreds of folks that were on the webcast today. Uh, this will be available uh, for replay on the NASIO and PTI websites. We'll make sure that gets uploaded, and again, uh, thank you for your attendance and attention today, and have a great rest of the day. Bye.